Thank you for having me. Um, I'm part of the um, CSC um, Origin and Function of Metaorganisms, and my talk today is titled Host Microbiota Interactions Insights from Human Genetics and Primate Evolution. Um, so just briefly, um, where I work at, um, this is the Center of Molecular Biosciences, and this is, um, so the institute I work at is the IKMB, which is one of the um, institutes inside this building. And um, yeah, we are somewhere at the interface between the university and the university clinic. And um, our focus of the institute is basically to discover um, biomarkers based on uh, NGS applications and well, omics uh, technologies um, to identify uh, biomarkers and treatment targets. Um, our also oh, uh, pet diseases are um, mostly chronic inflammatory disorders, um, mostly of the intestine, for example, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And I uh, myself am part of the microbiome subgroup, which is, uh, well, these five people and me. And we are part of the larger uh, genetics and bioinformatics group, um, which is led by Andre Franke. Um, so uh, coming back to my title, um, Insights from Human Genetics and Primate Evolution. So on one hand, I will briefly talk about a recent study we, where we performed a, a microbiome GWAS, so a genome-wide association study to look at microbiome traits in humans, but also about primate evolution, um, which I will talk about a little longer today. Um, the general framework of my work is the idea of um, yeah, evolutionary medicine or Darwinian medicine. So thinking more about the reasons why people get sick, uh, sick in an um, evolutionary um, perspective. So not only looking at the proximal explanations, but also um, the, the whole human or even previous um, development of um, uh, humans. Um, so... Briefly up the, about the microbiome, G was um, so we looked at um, uh, associations between a specific genetic um, markers um, in the human genome and um, the presence and absence, as well as abundance and community composition of the gut microbiome in almost nine thousand German individuals from three different sites: uh, one in uh, northern Germany, uh, one in northeastern Germany, and one in southern Germany. And what we could identify were 38 loci, um, so genomic points where we can find um, at least genome-wide significant signals, which um, could identify candidates of host microbiome interactions. And one that we found particularly interesting is on chromosome 9 here. Um, it's the locus which um, encodes for the ABO histoblood group transferase. So that gene which decides um, which um, blood group you may have. And um, also, which um, antigens, uh, antibodies you don't um, develop in your life. And um, we think that this is very interesting because um, these antibodies also are not there from the um, beginning, so from birth, but also develop um, in the first month of life. And um, uh, we believe that this might be in connection to the human microbiome and how this develops. So we think that there might be some kind of window of opportunity um, early in life, which is important for community assembly and what the immune system encounters and what not, um, which might decide um, how the microbiome then looks like uh, uh, a long life history um, and also in connection with uh, specific genes, for example, the ABO locus. Um, in addition to these findings, we performed um, so-called Mendelian randomization analysis, which tried to infer causality from the associations that we find. And um, in these, we find that um, several bacteria were identified to have uh, potential causative effects or protective effects on, um, for example, inflammatory bowel disease, um, which we will investigate further in our um, future studies. Um, so coming to the second part of the talk, um, we are also looking at primate microbiota, and we're doing this together with um, the Lehndatz lab from the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin. And we performed um, metagenomic sequencing from fecal samples from um, humans living in Germany, but also from humans living in Africa in more rural areas, but also six populations of wild non-human primates, um, where there's three subspecies of um, chimpanzees, um, one population, a small population of bonobos, and um, two subspecies of the gorilla. And looking at these data, we find that it's also kind of a challenging data set to work with because looking at humans, 
you find this here in the middle, the large pink bus. Uh, large parts of the community are well described and known species. Um, also, again, defined on uh, genome similarity. But looking at all the other uh, hosts we're looking at, we find that they are mostly only um, defined on genus level. So there's a lot of diversity that is simply not known yet in, in this context. Um, so and still, we were able to assemble um, good quality metagenome assembled genomes from um, this data set. And when we're looking at these communities, um, this might not um, look too clear, but looking at it in another way, we see that um, performing um, median clustering of these um, different points, that there's a clear subcluster of um, the pan genus, so um, bonobos and all chimpanzees. There's a clear subcluster of the gorilla um, species. But if you look at the humans, you see there's a big difference between the humans living in Germany and the humans living in Africa. And um, actually, this um, westernization that we see here in the German humans um, breaks this pattern of phylosymbiosis, so um, where the evolutionary distance is recapitulated in the microbiota, which is more visible here in the um, humans living in Africa. So <clears throat> having a closer look at the um, human samples and um, the grade of westernization, we identify four different clusters uh, of um, behavior. Um, for example, um, Akamansia, which is a major player in the um, Western human microbiota. Um, here we see several taxa um, that are very, very specific only for the Western microbiota, but, but which are basically not there in the um, microbiota of uh, humans living in Africa. So it must be something that is really specific for westernization and pretty recently um, acquired to the microbiome. In addition, we see core members of the human microbiome that follow some kind of westernization gradient, if you want so. Um, one of them is bacteroides, um, which are basically absent when you're looking at the um, uh, great ape samples. Um, we see a few samples in the uh, humans living in Africa where they are present and also abundant. But looking at the humans um, living in Germany, we see that they are basically there everywhere and also in quite high uh, abundances, in some parts reaching clearly above 50% of the whole community. And looking at Prevotella, um, we see the, the opposite pattern. So in the um, great ape samples, they are very, very common and very uh, abundant. Looking at the humans living in Africa, they are um, very much similar to, to um, the samples that we have from um, great apes. But in humans, there are just a few samples where they are um, present and in some cases also very abundant. But for the majority of samples, they are very, very low, abundant, or even absent. And um, so here we can also say that there was some kind of loss of these taxa um, accompanying the westernization. And this is, for example, also true for the genus Triponema. And um, the last pattern we see um, is, is very special. So um, what we see here in Zuccini Vibrio, for example, is that um, these are basically not very present in um, the great ape samples. They are quite abundant in the um, humans living in Africa, but they are completely absent in the um, westernized humans. So this is, seems to be something that is probably very diet specific um, and yeah, um, for, um, likely very specified to, to something that um, the people eat or um, coming from the environment. And this is something we will investigate further. Um, but again, this whole shift from um, the Prevotella dominated community towards the uh, um, Bacteroid um, dominated community is something that has been seen before in um, other studies. And this just again confirms um, that, yeah, looking at, at Western populations um, also means looking at something that might not be uh, representing the, the natural or ancestral state of the human microbiota. So it um, makes a lot of sense, in my opinion, to expand studies um, also to uh, less represented populations from, for example, Africa or South America, which is done by only a few groups worldwide, um, but should really um, shift into the focus of uh, micro human microbiome research. So um, to summarize, 
we think there are strong evidence that um, host genetics influence the gut microbiome, but also here, again, we are looking at a Western population. So um, it might be much more interesting to um, perform similar analysis in non-Western populations. Um, because here we could maybe see more of the natural communities and maybe get more signals from the uh, evolutionary conserved patterns and interactions between the host and the microbiome. Um, and in general, the question that we ask is um, what defines or what shapes a healthy microbiota? And uh, as you can see, we try to um, address this from different angles. Um, looking at genetics or also evolutionary history of um, humans and yeah, their ancestors. Um, so with this, I'm already coming to uh, the end of my talk. I want to thank the people at the Robert Koch Institute um, who we are working with on different projects. Um, John Baines and his group from the MPI in Plön, close to Kiel, and uh, of course the IKMB. Uh, I want to thank the, um, yeah, the CSC um, for funding me and my position. And of course, key life sciences as, um, as an umbrella for, for all our projects and um, the different cohorts that were involved in the um, large metagenome um, microbiome GWAS that we performed. So um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malta. Um, so we have a question, I think, from Miguel. Hi, uh, Thomas. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm... I'm really thrilled about uh, about this work, and I was not aware of it. I saw you in the program. I've been looking at it this morning, and let me tell you why. Sunima so Singh, who was doing a PhD with us, <clears throat> found that alpha gal, which is a gal one three gal, which is basically the B blood group without a few codes in the second gal, really influences the composition of the gut microbiota uh, in mice. And so I'm thrilled to see that you find a strong signal with blood group and microbiota composition of humans. Do you care to speculate <laughs> a little bit further on why do you think uh, this is being influenced and whether you think there could be a, a, a functional relationship between what we're finding with alpha-gal and what you found with yeah. uh, B blood group? Um, sure. Um, well, in general, of course, um, as you already said, these are um, sugar residues, which um, on, on the easy side could be um, something that is just um, used as energy source by a specific bacteria. Um, so this, this could be one of the easy explanations for this. But also we see that there are these antibodies that are developed against blood groups or um, well, the, the blood group antigens that you don't have in your body. So um, and, and as I said, they are developed sometime early in life. So I think this is really something that um, is, is some kind of acquired mechanism, depending on what you actually encounter in your early life, um, which might decide on that. And um, there are additional studies from the lab of, um, um, uh, so the Lusopon lab, uh, Catherine Lusopon, um, we're also looking at specific bacteroides um, fragilis groups, um, which seem to also um, confirm, especially this um, uh, connection between um, the different blood group antigens and, um, yeah, in this case, um, bacteroides. And there they see that um, it, um, yeah, there are specific um, effects um, in. Oh, I, I don't want to say something wrong there, but there are preprints out um, by. Um, uh, Catherine Arnold's from the Lozoporn lab, which um, confirm also that there are specific um, uh, proteins in the bacteria that um, really interact with um, the human blood group antigens. So um, we are investigating this now further, um, but yeah, we are also very interested in, in going on into this direction. If you allow me more of a comment, <clears throat> it would be really interesting, at least for us, to try to match what type of changes in the microbiota we see in mice when we take out this alpha-gal and see if it matches in any way with what you call, what you refer to as being the core components of the microbiota of humans. Yeah, I, well, of course we can try that, but um, we are looking at population controls. And I think here the, the effects are really just 
just minor and just statistical significant because we use that large cohorts. Mm. Um, but I think if you have specific bacteria that you want to look up um, and see um, that change, um, this, can, th this should be pretty easy to, to look at in, in our cohorts and see if we actually see similar patterns. So um, if you want to, please, please get in contact and we can talk about this. Thank you very much. Very, Thank you. Very nice. Thank you.